All right, guys, so welcome back to a brand new episode here on The Goo Review. So for today's episode, we are going to be looking at the movie Talk To Me. Now, I'm filming this very late at night. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do a lot of videos but i just purchased a uh, sasquatch sunset on amazon because it's oh it is discounted and i knew it would be it's a very controversial film it's another kind of experimental artistic movie and i don't know i heard that some scenes are gruesome but i don't know if that's going to be like what makes it horror? I don't know as though you could consider it a horror movie even, but you know, we're gonna check it out. But because I am getting ready to watch that one tonight and take all my notes and whatnot, we need to get this one out of the way. So we are watching or talking about Talk To Me, which is, we're only doing international film so far. That's a little ironic. I'm not meaning to do that. But this is an Australian movie. <laughs> and the directors is a pair of brothers. They're actually YouTubers. So they were making like short films and whatnot on YouTube before they moved in. This is their first major like length picture. And honestly, well, I think there are probably some downfalls here or there. I think it's a solid, solid uh, movie. I really do. So it's directed by Danny and Michael Philip. Pooh Philippow, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, it is starring Sophie Wilde, she plays Mia, Alexandra Jensen, who plays Jade, her friend, Joe Bird, who is young Riley, Otis Donnie, Danny Dahani, uh, he plays Daniel, Miranda Otto plays Sue, and she also is Zelda Spellman, if you know, in the uh, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. As soon as I saw her, I was like, <laughs> I didn't know that she was, um, I guess, an international star. I don't know if she's Australian. I'll be honest, I only know of her in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, but I love her character in that, and I love her character in this movie. I'm going to be so for real with you. While obviously, like, she's not the highlight, she's my favorite character by far. <laughs> Definitely. Zoe Tarakis, who plays Haley. And now uh, the actor who plays them is non-binary in real life. So, you know, I'm just going to refer to the character with they, them pronouns just because. And it's definitely the vibe. It's the vibe. If you've seen the movie, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, the film follows a group of teenagers who discover they are able to contact spirits using a mysterious severed and embalmed hand. Pretty basic, I guess. Sounds Ouija-ish, but there's some deeper kind of, um, I guess, themes in this movie. We'll get into it. Content warning for this film end this discussion because we are going to get into it substance abuse addiction mental health suicide and the movie it i think it spaces it out very well so you're not like hit over the head with it and sometimes scenes are done from like a distance so it's not like up close and personal but the gore in this movie is heavy there's not too many things that can make me like Ugh. nowadays you know most of the time if like gore violence happens i'm not gonna lie it kind of makes me laugh sometimes that probably makes me seem like a psycho but it just makes me laugh you know like in in a violent nature when the yoga girl gets killed i was laughing because it was just so absurd you know like oh my god <laughs> Yeah, so it is a violent movie, and I would say the aspect of, like, the self-harm is very, very graphic. So be mindful of that, you know? Um, and, yeah, we are we are going to discuss it, but we're not going to, like, go into it too, too deep. Um, it's just, it's a very prominent theme in the movie. So this movie, I find it ironic. If you know, you know <laughs> why I'm mentioning this. This movie is blocked in Kuwait. So <laughs> they were worried about it affecting social decency and stuff like that. It's be, I think it's because um, it heavily implies the drug use aspect. And something that I find interesting 
This is very like Ty West of them, you know, like X uh, trilogy. They already have a prequel filmed, already have it filmed. And a sequel is also now in the works. I'm excited, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie, I did enjoy this movie. So it had a very, very good reception from uh, the audiences at the Cannes Movie Festival. So that's what kind of like kickstarted it, you know? I don't think it was planned to do a worldwide release like it did. We see horror nowadays getting a lot of like help from the audience itself, which I enjoy that. Uh, grossed nearly 100 million, which I, this was, I think, the number after like opening weekend or so. So it's probably way more than that by now. The directors, they were talking about it's inspired by a video of someone that they knew growing up and they were having a bad drug reaction and everyone is just filming them. And you definitely see that. It's the first scene is, I think, like reference to that. And then throughout the movie, whenever they are using, it's always like cameras and faces and stuff like that. It's, I think that's one of the most unsettling parts about it, you know, is the aspect of like voyeurism almost. With that, we are going to dive in. This movie is very, very um, metaphorical so i want to dive into this a bit deeper than we normally would for some movies this one i think it can be analyzed much much deeper i really really do uh there's more to really take away from it i think and more to discuss so yeah we're gonna go into this i took like five almost six pages of notes <clears throat> So let's get started. So the movie opens with a guy that is looking for his brother. He's wandering like through a party and it's all one continuous shot until the very end of the scene where the violence happens. It is one continuous shot. Apparently, if you pay attention, the directors and some other people are hidden in there. But I, this is just after one viewing. I'm sure I will probably watch this one again. So it's a good one. He finds his brother locked in a room and it's just like this huge loud party going on. And the parents are there, breaks down the door, gets them out and everyone has their phones out, flashes on recording what's happening. And he's like pleading with them to please stop recording. And that like really broke my heart. I'm not gonna lie to you. That was really like, oh. I mean, instantly it sets up the movie for what it's going to be, you know? It's going to be that unsettling kind of voyeuristic theme throughout the entire film. So while that's happening, the brother manages to grab a knife, stabs the other brother in the chest, and then he wanders outside. People are still standing around. He wanders outside and stabs himself in the face. It's from a distance, so like you don't see it up close, thank God, but it's very graphic. Um, and it just opens the movie with a bang. Some time passes on and then we focus on to now our main, main character, Mia, um, who is mourning the loss of her mom. It's the two year anniversary of her mom's. What we are told was a accidental suicide. She accidentally took too many pills and like just right off, you understand that she is struggling with the grief of it and trying to connect with her father. Sets off the case right away for Mia's mental health just not being the best. Cut to young Riley who's with his friend sitting on the curb and his friend has a cigarette. You know, it's this kind of idea of peer pressure coming in, which obviously is going to play a vital role. Uh, but Riley doesn't smoke the cigarette. He's a good kid. <laughs> or he contacted Mia to get a ride because his sister wasn't answering. And she's very close with their family. So they are going to act as like the family unit for Mia throughout this movie. Now before this, with the with Riley and his friends sitting on the curb talking, I thought it sounded so BS, the dialogue. Not the way the actors were delivering it because I think all of the actors in this movie are incredible. 
all of them. It wasn't the acting. I think it was just, like, dialogue issues. It just came off, like, unrelatable, you know? When it's the older kids talking, it makes more sense, but I think having to write for young, young teen kids is hard. So, you know, they were just using dialogue or lingo that was already, like, out of style at that point. So it just kind of doesn't make sense, I guess. But uh, the chandelier scene with them singing in the car is freaking hilarious until they ro drive up on a kangaroo that was hit in the middle of the road. It's a tough scene. It is. It's gory. Not as gory as it could have been, though. Mia decides that they need to put it out of its misery. I mean, Riley's clearly very, very upset by it. And so she backs up the car and drives forward really fast to run it over its head, but slams on the brakes right before, ends up driving around it and says another car will come along soon. This might seem like nothing, but it I think it plays into the entire story just in general of a inability to put something out of its misery whether whether it's something else or yourself and like having to find the strength to do that having to find the strength to save something so mia is going to and you'll see the kangaroo again you're going to see it again uh but mia is going to have to make that decision again later on they're hanging out at Riley's house to see Jade, Mia's friend, his sister, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then this was when I found out that the mom was Zelda Spellman. And I was like, love it, <laughs> love it. You can clearly tell that Mia feels very strongly connected to this family. Um, I mean, she spends more time with that family than with her own. But they're looking at their phones and gossiping about this strange video. And you see glimpses of it. It's like a Snapchat video from someone of people like convulsed kind of in a chair and their eyes are completely black, like they're possessed. And so they're just like talking about how like, oh no, it's definitely fake. It's gotta be fake. It's building up to like Mia's curiosity. And it's just, it's very much giving like drug use. It, it just is, you know? And I think if you don't wanna look at it as that, that's fine, that's fine. But I think it's very hard to ignore. I really do. Cause even the effects that happen later on, I think can all relate back to the effects of drug use and addiction and grieving and trying to work through that grief through substance abuse like but they sneak out they don't really sneak out like sue the mom is very cool i guess and is just like well i know you're going so just tell me like when you're going to be back and they're still adamant about lying to her for whatever reason. <laughs> so they end up sneaking off to a party to witness this thing. And Riley tags along with them, which, odd, younger brother. But he says, oh, I'll tell mom. She already knows. <laughs> it says, okay, whatever. So Mia is very awkward at the party. And Haley talks maybe a little bit flirts with Jade saying like, why'd you bring her? Like, you know, I don't like her. She's too clean. You know, Jade stands up for her friend. The quick, the party very quickly moves on to this thing, this, you know, spectacle that we've been seeing little glimpses of. Ironically enough, Mia volunteers first for a completely unknown thing. She doesn't even know that it's the hand yet. You know, she just said, I'll do it. Yep. Which that obviously is extremely out of character for Mia and you can see that Mia uses not uses in a bad way but like she uses this other family and their connection to like cope with the loss of her own like family structure so she's grieving hard like it's very evident that she's just not okay you know it's okay to not be okay but it's starting you know this is the beginning phases of like Mia's addiction. Haley explains the rules a little bit. Like there's a 90 second um, maximum kind of for it that you can't go past 90 seconds, which 
I don't know, if y'all know what salvia is, then you know, like, I think it's relating to that. I do. Uh, cause it's a very short, quick high, and people tend to freak out during it. It used to be completely legal at one point. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details, okay? I'm just not, you guys. So they explain it, you have to say, talk to me, and then you say, I let you in, and that's when the possession happens. So Mia says, talk to me. And a old man is like pops up and is sitting right in front of her. No one else can see her and she freaks out. And so it doesn't work right away. And so she calls it again and a disgusting, bloated, decaying corpse is sitting right in front of her. And so she does the, I let you in, Mia is like thrown back in the chair and you can see she's like struggling somewhat quickly kind of like washes away and then you can see that Mia isn't Mia anymore she's possessed by this other thing and of course everyone is recording and playing along she's like making reference to things that aren't really in the room and talking to people but like in a different voice, almost kind of like gollum -y. But then she begins to threaten Riley. I think the spirits had already kind of picked out that they wanted Riley by this point. They saw him and was like, that one. <laughs> the 90 seconds, it goes past that just a bit because they try to take the hand from Mia's hand and she pulls it away holds on to it and so they have to fight with her to get her hand off she's strapped into the chair so like she can't get up but that might be why what happens later to mia is what happened because she was kept connected even just for a few seconds too long and kind of slipping into that like permanent psychosis kind of. And you can, once they get the hand off and Mia like comes to a bit, you can tell she got a rush. She got a rush. And even later on when she was talking to Riley about what it felt like, she was talking about how it felt like warm, like there was this glow and everything just felt like peaceful, very, different from what we see but <laughs> it's giving like euphoric kind of high and it honestly felt like from that very first go she's hooked already like it's a coping mechanism on the rise i guess and then they're in bed later that night after the party um and mia is talking to riley because the relationship that these characters have i think is very interesting Riley is extremely close with Mia, looks up to her like a big sister, and I think can rely on her as one a bit more than his own real sister, because he says that he's scared and he doesn't want to sleep by himself. Now, he is well into his teen years, but like, that's still sweet. And she tells him, no, you know, get the hell out of my room. But Mia, who's sleeping on the couch, she allows him to come and sleep with her and they're just talking and she explains to him like how it felt to do the hand thing and is also talking about how Mia has nightmares that she doesn't exist, which I think plays into kind of that like out of body viewing that we kind of see I think throughout the film, but specifically at the very end, like this disassociating that happens to Mia. And then like, as they are laying in bed, you see Mia's hand like kind of brushing Riley's hair while he's sleeping. And then it all of a sudden changes to the woman's like bloated hand. So we already know like that connection wasn't completely severed. And then it's the next day, blah, 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 or uh, some amount of time passes. And you get one of the best scenes with um, Sue's character. It's just, she, for me, is the highlight standout of the movie. Just is. They're getting ready for the second party. And they're explaining more about, like, where Haley found the hand and where, like, heard stories from about it and whatnot. Allegedly, it's a ceramic embalmed hand of a psychist or Satanist. It's not really, like, specified. 
or they're not sure. And so Daniel, Jade's boyfriend, does it. Also, Daniel and Mia dated at one point, but like it wasn't serious, but like it seemed like a, a little bit was. So Daniel does it and it's telling like all of his secrets specifically like telling jade how like she isn't enough to arouse daniel like really embarrassing the both of them but then like it's a horny horny ghost he like flips the chair over and is like you know getting busy with the floor and everyone is recording him too and then the dog comes over nothing happens to the dog you guys okay fair warning fair fair warning there is a dog in this but it nothing happens to it okay he starts making out with the dog and it's such a disgusting scene it's so gross oh my god disgusting um but then they're able to get the hand off they close this like portal whatever blow out the candle and he starts to freak out because he realizes like everybody recorded this and he's freaking out. I mean, rightfully so. He's begging them to please, please delete it. And it's honestly like heartbreaking. And he storms out, but he comes back later on and does it more. So then Mia goes again and then it kind of goes into a montage where everyone's just like taking turns like passing it around it's a fun segment i'm not gonna lie like it's still a little disturbing to see it like this because you know what it's com like supposed to be about so like you have that underlining layer of just like ickiness um but you get it you you get it you know what it's supposed to be and they're smoking while they're doing it like eventually riley wants to try it and his sister jade freaks out says absolutely not but for some reason she ends up leaving the room not sure why that would be a smart thing to do they begin to do it anyways and mia is like guiding him coaching him in a way that i'm just going to say felt gross to me you know like it felt gross to be misguiding him like this especially because like they're doing this thing that they don't know the repercussions of while Haley and their friend i don't think they're dating i think they're just friends the tall like football jock looking dude they know they know because they know what happened to the guy originally so they know the risk of all of this and yet it's still just being played off as like this fun party game so like it i know mia is misguided in this as well but it just felt so icky and mia's mom ends up coming through riley she very selfishly very very selfishly mia's grief made her act extremely selfishly and because of that riley is going to get hurt he stays connected far too long because mia wants to talk to her mother and he begins to because he's still strapped down he begins to violently bash his face into the corner of the table violently it's bad you guys he also tries to pull his own eye out it's really disturbing it's graphic uh very fair warning for that scene i think all of the scenes involving riley are the most brutal and the hardest to watch because it's a kid you know like that the actor who played riley kudos and then he's thrown like dr not thrown i guess maybe dragged across the room in the chair and then the chair aligns itself with another edge and he like you can tell he's not in control of his body and he's just smashing his face into the corner of this table jade is able to block the very last hit that probably would have done him in with her hand hurts her hand of course but i think that's what saved riley and so they're freaking out they're freaking out they never officially closed the like portal but I'm going to call it a portal because it seems very Ouija board-ish. You s notice in the background while the police are there and everything, the candle is still lit. That's important. Uh, Mia is like in shock. Like while everything is happening, she doesn't even like 
help Riley. That seems, like, bad, but she, like, goes into shock and just kind of, like, completely disassociates from everything, even though, like, girl, you held his hand while guiding him into this. Like, Mia is a very nuanced and complicated character, okay? I just want to say that. She's very nuanced, and I don't think you are supposed to entirely like her, but you do sympathize with her. You know what I mean? Like, you can sympathize with someone and not agree with the route that they're going. And then it gives a little bit of exposition, like Mia thinks that her dad is lying about her mom's death, which he is. But it also shows she stole the hand. She stole it from the party. Freaking, oh my god. But it cuts to Riley in the hospital, and it, oh my god. It's so tough to look at, because it's just so graphic and disgusting. Um, but she's not welcome there. Sue is very upfront about how um, she thinks Mia just kind of like weaseled her way into their family, which Sue was obviously speaking out of anger because later on they have a little bit of like a reconciliation, not really, but uh, Mia's not welcome there at all, her at all. There is a bathroom scene in the hospital. Mia sees her mom walking through the halls and she follows her into a restroom and then a one of the stall doors slams shut she hears her mom on the other side so she tries to push it open and it's very obviously a connection to the story she told about her mother's passing how her father found her mother and she passed up against the door so he had to like you know really push and push and push to get it open and that's direct i mean it's got to be that reference to that so just like where we are in the movie now it felt like the analysis kind of that i was having from it at the moment was that like trauma intensifying and hurting others as it goes especially as it goes unaddressed and through like self-medication how that hurt can maybe be taken from you momentarily but it's also being placed onto others around you you know after the hospital mia ends up hanging out with daniel it's a little weird like slightly romantic ish you'll notice that mia i think treads the line lightly of being like the flirty friend you know that doesn't mean to but they're just overly friendly with the people that they're friendly with you know what I mean? Also, uh, Sue is upset at her own daughter, obviously, uh, even though she was adamant about not doing it and they went behind her back, but through the party and everything, so, you know. So they're sleeping in bed, like, facing opposite directions, and Mia sees a corpse in the corner crawling towards the bed, and it's going and going, and then it crawls up, and begins to start sucking on Daniel's toes. There is toe sucking in this, you guys. <laughs> uh, well, before the corpse, Mia's having a bad dream and her dad finding her mom playing over like a dream of Daniel. And then she realizes that uh, her fingernails are all scratched up, kind of like as if she were clawing at the door and the representation that we get of her mother it's not really her mom and there are hints of that if you watch some of the scenes where they show the mom's hands you can see that there are like the scraped nails but underneath those nails are like longer pointy nails such a great fine detail but if you pay attention, it is there. That just shows that, like, this is something else. You know, it's not Mia's mom. So, yeah, back to the toe sucking. <laughs> Mia, like, wakes up, comes to, and it's actually her sucking on Daniel's toes. And, of course, it's super awkward and weird, obviously. I think it's 
kind of symbolic of how drugs can make you act out of line like how you wouldn't normally act and stuff like that because by all means we've been led up to believe that Mia doesn't actually still have like romantic feelings like that for Daniel and it's not really shown again like that throughout the rest of the movie so I don't think that's the case but she's acting out of line because of her mental state. And then she decides, after Daniel rightfully storms out, um, <laughs> she decides to try and contact her mom alone with the hand. <sighs> of course, she doesn't say, I let you in or anything like that. But still, it just, that doesn't seem safe. But she does end up talking to her mom a bit. So, or her mom we get a look at more so at riley he was this kid was absolutely brutalized you guys it's terrible to look at i'm not gonna lie and the makeup is a freaking good job <laughs> this is another hard scene to watch riley is on the toilet in the bathroom and his sister is watching over him as her mom goes and like takes care of something and Riley's just not there, you know, like he's just not really there, but he comes to for a brief second and as he does, he attempts again. He bites his sister's hand and then like throws himself to the ground and is just smashing his head backwards into the tile and it's very bloody, very disturbing and he's laughing while doing it and then starts to lick up his own blood it's all spaced out so like it's not super hard gore all the time but it is very very graphic and uh, pretty hard to watch honestly because you really feel for riley you really really feel for him and this just you know feels reminiscent of like long last lasting effects after one time use for some people, even if it's not the majority of experiences, some people have that experience. And I think this is, you know, playing into that. Mia asks the others if they're seeing things and they act like, uh, no, no. And of course, we know later on that Haley and their friend, they know they know what that means because that's what happened to the brother in the very beginning and then they somehow get the brilliant freaking idea to try it on riley again making him unconsensually do this again to try and save him doesn't seem to make sense to me mia tries to talk to riley with it but a little girl appears instead and she shows Mia what is happening to Riley's like soul wherever he is. I think it's supposed to be like a purgatory, but I think these spirits come directly from like a hell because it just, it flashes to like this room and the walls are just bloody. Everyone's naked and covered in blood and you just see Riley in the middle of dozens and dozens of hands just tearing at him so like just he's in constant eternal agony down there that quickly snaps Mia out of it and she just you know she's taking in I think the full severity of her own actions in this this adds to it more she can't get the pain that Riley's going through out of her head the pain that she kind of caused not really but like indirectly by supporting it and encouraging it she helped cause this so this is a very um kind of emotional scene and i think it was done well mia's dad has a confession uh to tell her and he reveals a letter left from her mom it was a suicide letter and it was just apologizing you know for the pain that she was inevitably going to cause but she also like it's it's very sad it really is but i think it was done in kind of like a beautiful way it starts off that like today was the first day in years that i've been hopeful and that's just very very unfortunate i think it's a very real look at mental illness that for some people when that day if that day comes where they do decide some people are very hopeful about it and it's just 
it's the really untalked about because I think it's like, oh, well, no, you're supposed to feel bad. You're supposed to want to live. Like, yes, yeah, I get that. But that's the reality of it is that depression makes you hopeful to die. And that's sad. It's very sad. Um, but while this is happening, the s spirit of Mia's mother is in Mia's ear lying to her, saying that it's not Mia's dad. Mia goes upstairs and it continues with the spirit. And I took this kind of as like addiction turning loved ones into threats. You view them as a threat after because they could be trying to pull you from your substance, you know? It just... I don't think you need to read into all of these instances, like, with the ghosts and whatnot, but I think it all is very symbolic of just, like, the struggle of addiction and grief. The fake dad attacks Mia, but... Of course, it's all like a big hallucination and Mia ends up stabbing her real father right in the neck, I believe. And once again, she just completely disassociates, you know? It's like Mia removes herself kind of from the situation. She just goes cold and like walks out. Mia then calls Jade to fix Riley tells her to come and meet her at her house, I believe. It's all just a distraction to get Jade away from Riley. Mia has been told now that in order to free Riley, she needs to kill him. By the rules we were told in the beginning, if you die with them in you, then you're theirs forever. So his misery wouldn't end if he were to die. But even when she's on the phone trying to explain to Jade that like she knows what to do to fix Riley, Jade's saying like, no, he's been coming to more and he hasn't tried to hurt himself. Like he's actually starting to get better. Mia just, you know, goes along with the diversion. That too feels symbolic. So Mia is like apologizing to Riley as she's alone with him in his hospital bed. And it's during this portion or maybe afterwards that she sees the kangaroo hopping in the hallway. And I think that's when it dawns on her, you know, like the choice she has to make. Sue, Riley's mom, interrupts and she apologizes to her and just confesses that she was speaking out of anger, you know. It's a very sweet moment, but then Mia goes and steals Riley. The catheter, Riley's catheter, starts to fill up with blood and then it pans up and Mia sees a corpse laying in Riley's bed basically mocking just like them in general. And she raises a pair of scissors to stab it, but she holds herself back, okay? So like, she has some self-control in this, she does. Uh, while all that's happening, Jade discovers N Mia's dad in their house. The dad's still alive, dad survives. I think they make that clear in the end where uh, Mia's running through the hospital halls and the lights are starting to turn off. And she sees her father walk into the elevator and then the doors close. I think that's like symbolic of him not crossing over he is you know on his way back to the physical world so mia runs off uh with riley in a wheelchair wheeling him towards a freeway all the while like being led by her mom mom this obviously feels as like another kind of call back to the kangaroo thing of like another car will come mia ends up being the one i mean there's a crash like you see the car's swerving and everything, and something hit a windshield, but you're not quite sure what until you see Mia lying in the road and Riley still on the hillside or up on like the curb, whatever, you know. <laughs> she ends up like standing up and like just looking around being like, huh? You, you know, you know. She was hit by a truck too. It wasn't just like a normal car. It was a truck that she hit. So, no, she is dead. It's her back in the hospital, and she's seeing Riley recovering with his family and getting ready to leave the hospital. So uh, he's about to go back into the physical realm as well as her father. And as she's chasing down her dad, specifically, all of the lights are turning off. She comes up on this, oh, once it goes dark, 
or maybe once she passes, I think it's once it goes dark, the aspect ratio of the screen changes. Now, I'm not the most like brilliant uh, film person out there. So I don't know, but that like, just that compressing, um, it feels so much tighter. I think that's for a reason, like we are now on the other side of it, okay? We come to realize this glowing hole that Mia is seeing is actually an entryway for her as a spirit to now be a part of the game that she was once using. So she is now the one whose hand is holding on to the other persons in the chair. It's such a like, whoa, very good ending for this movie. Very, very good ending, I think. A little bit like, kind of like, oh, now it's her turn. <laughs> But I think it's a really good ending. I think it works well. And it builds you to like want to know now what these other movies are going to consist of. And then now you have like a kind of newfound sympathy for these spirits who were stuck in limbo and being used for these teenage kids high school like party games and being tormented for their enjoyment. It's it's a lot, guys. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot. It's a great movie, though. I highly recommend it. So that's the main run through that I wanted to do. Give my thoughts on that. We are going to check some reviews. So let's check that out real quick. I did check these out before, of course. So this one got rated very highly over 12,000 global ratings, 4.4 out of five stars. So it was widely well received. Uh, even the top critical comment still gives it three stars. But this, the top positive review, it's extremely short. Uh, scariest movie I've seen in years, well-developed characters, edge of your seat direction, horror fans don't miss this gem. Thousand percent agree, but I want to read another longer, more descriptive one. This is a long one, they go in. Title, A Haunting Journey into the Unknown, a spoiler-free review of the movie. Graced with a captivating narrative, powerful performances, and chilling visuals, the film ventures into a realm of supernatural horror that has been seldom traversed in contemporary cinema. The premise will grip you from the very first frame, a party taking an unexpected, devastating turn sets the stage for a narrative filled with deep-seated family secrets, the struggle of adolescence, and the traumatizing impact of loss. Ari McCarthy as Cole and Sonny Johnson as Duckett effectively kickstart the chilling and heart-wrenching journey with their dramatic and raw performances. Also, um, Sonny, the brother who got stabbed, he ends up living. They run into him on a bus later on. And he gives grief to Haley and their friend about ruining people's lives with this thing. And that's when more so they come clean about it. I forgot to take notes on that part, guys. Sorry. But it's Sophie Wilde's portrayal of the grief-stricken Mia coping with the loss of her mother, played by Alexandria Stephenson, while navigating her complex relationship with her father that stays with you. The interactions between Mia, her friend Jade, and her younger brother Riley set the tone of the story and contribute to the emotional depth and supernatural undertone of the plot. The devastating encounter with the, injury, with the injured kangaroo serves as a poignant metaphor for impending doom. The supernatural proceedings of the film reach a crescendo at the party filled with eerie incidents and hair-raising moments. The talk to me game and its consequential events instill a deep sense of dread that carries through for the rest of the film as the unknowing teenagers confront malevolent spirits. Supporting performances including Miranda Otto as Sue, Chris Alosia as Joss, I believe that's Haley's friend, and others add dimensions to the narrative and boost the overall tension of the film. The film masterfully combines supernatural occurrences with emotional intrigues, creating a chilling atmosphere. Though initially startling, the intent behind the peculiar occurrences, including the horrifying possession of Daniel and nearly fatal incidents involving Riley, provide a much needed momentum to the proceedings, 
Mia's tumultuous journey, culminating in a startling realization about her mother's demise, leaves both her and the viewers in utter shock. Crafted creatively and presented meticulously, the movie seamlessly amalgamates supernatural themes with human drama. Making it an exhilarating watch, it touches upon the often unexplored territory of spiritual possession and adds a distinct flair to it. The shocking and heart-rending, heart-rending, heart-rending developments tear you apart, leaving you anticipating what's going to happen next. In conclusion, the film is an eerily chilling and emotionally penetrating journey that validates the saying, truth is often stranger than fiction. The intense performances and gripping narrative make this a must-watch. Five stars for this haunting masterpiece. I think that's such a great review. I really do sweet it's a little long but it's sweet and to the point honestly and the top critical one like i said is hardly even that critical it says freaky but dumb but kind of dumbed down i don't know it's all necessarily dumbed down but i think they gave it a lot of different entryways for people to be viewing this from if that makes sense so this is their review okay confession time talk to me works when it's supposed to and nothing bad I'm about to say can change the fact that this movie has pretty great production value. A decent script and a cast that works when they need to. The scares are expected but still fun. The whole thing oozes of an otherness that makes you feel like you shouldn't be watching even when you can't really look away. And the ending is almost as surprising, mainly because you were hoping for a happy ending. As it is completely predictable, you don't mess with something on a cosmic level like this without expecting comeuppance. <laughs> Unfortunately, Talk To Me suffers from what has become a weird staple of many recent movies where young people frequent the victim pool. They do something no sane human being with any sense, self-preservation, not even teenagers would logically do. Why do they keep playing the death game? Regardless of how high one could get off such an experience, and they seem to get very high, any game that involves a combination of willful possession and a time limit should have so many red flags it should be on a registry. Well, that's kind of the point. <laughs> Yet, despite the mostly believable characters continuing to defy logic and poking that bloated corpse bear, <laughs> the ghost people have some pretty amazing makeup effects, true. Talk To Me remains a movie that will still cause your skin to crawl at inopportune times. Sure, the scares are both telegraphed and mostly of the jump variety, but there's still a lot of skill here that doesn't get buried by the logic bomb that usually nukes these kind of movies. Go ahead and talk to them, just don't let them too far in. So, yeah, this is definitely our longest uh, review that we've done yet, guys, and like I said, they're not all going to be this in-depth. I just felt like there was so much to talk about in this one. Thank you so much for tuning on in. Like I said, the next movie we'll take a peek at is Sasquatch Sunset, and I'm excited for that one. I'm not going to lie. Thank you so much once again, guys. Oh, wait. I gotta... He's got to come and say hi, right? Come say hi to all your fans. Hop up. He's a big sleepyhead right now. Huh. So yeah, thank you so much for tuning in to our channel here, you guys. We truly do appreciate ya. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. <laughs> like and subscribe, become a channel member. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care. Oh wait, you wanna come back now? Oh no, <laughs> the ball.